Good morning. I'm going to convene us. There are some more chairs for people who are standing. And there are some more chairs coming so that nobody, nobody has, to, has to actually stand. We're, we're, just, we're delaying for a, for a few minutes to start because um, one of the early morning speakers is stuck in traffic, but he should be here in any, any minute. So um, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you very much for joining us. For those who I don't know, my name is Sandro Galea, and I have the privilege of serving as dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. And on behalf of the whole school, welcome to today's symposium. Part of the core role of public health is to explore how historic injustice shapes present health. I think this event is particularly important to this work. It is part of the 400 years of inequality national movement marking the anniversary of when the first Africans arrived in Jamestown to be sold into bondage. I was first educated about this movement by one, one of its founders, Dr. Bob Fullalove. Where's, where's Bob? There's Bob. Bob is a dear friend and colleague from Columbia who's here today and who will be speaking later. This symposium emerged out of conversations with Bob. Thank you, Bob. The other joy of this event has been partnering with many groups who have made this possible. We've partnered with the Activist Lab, by, led by Dean Harold Cox, from whom you'll hear in a second. The Activist Lab has built a whole suite of programs around this anniversary. We have also partnered with the Howard Thurman Center for Common Ground and the Museum of African American History. We are grateful to them all and look forward to what they will teach us today. My role today is actually quite simple. I'm only here to say, welcome to the school. Thank you for being part of the conversation. My role is also to say thank you to everybody who made it possible. In particular, I would like to acknowledge Meredith Brown, Catherine Etman, and Emily Barbo, who have made today possible and the whole suite of activities we have around 400 years of inequality throughout the week. But really, the person who is the vision behind the day and who's going to make the day work is Dean Harold Cox, our Dean of Practice, and a good friend and colleague for many, many years. Harold, over to you. Good morning, everybody. I am so very glad that all of you are here today. My mother's grandfather, which would make him my great-grandfather, was a slave. He worked on one of the plantations, one of the three large plantations in the state of Texas, and he was 23 years old when slavery ended. My uncle, who is now 92 years old, remembers him very well and talks about him fondly. Many black folks are able to count back and find someone in their family who has been a slave. There are many others of us who don't know who our family members were, where they came from, what they did. It is important then, then that what we understand is that slavery existed. Slavery tore families apart. Slavery reassembled families in different configurations. We know that as we think about the history of black folks in this country and we think about from slavery up to the current time, we can think about three very important things, repression, Resistance and resilience. Repression, hold them down. Resistance, fight back. Resilience, we can, we must, we will overcome. Here in our school over this last week and in the next several weeks, we are doing a number of activities to help commemorate this activity of slaves coming to this country and thinking about these issues of repression, resistance, and resilience. Our program today is one where we are going to have an opportunity to think about, so where did we come from, where are we right now, and where are we going? Now, we have had an opportunity to have a number of things coming up, and, and I'm really looking forward to today because we have a lot of smart people who are here with us today. Nobody else in the rest of the country is there, but they're all here. <laughs> so I'm really glad about that. I want to particularly put a plug in for what happens after lunch. We have had the great fortune of having Sister Rodesta Jones, who is a storyteller, to be with us all of this week. Rodesta is going to be with us after lunch. If you already know who Rodesta is, you know that she is a force of nature. 
If you don't know who she is, you need to know that she is raw, she is to the core, and she will tell it as it is. So I invite you to be part of what happens after lunch here as well. Now, programs like this don't happen just simply because we ask people to just do a program. Now, they invite me here to be the eye candy. <laughs> but there are other people that I have to thank for this program. Indeed, I have to first start with our dean, Sandro Galea. Dean Galea said, we will do this project. And I'm very appreciative to him for encouraging us and supporting us in doing this activity. It's important to thank Catherine Etman and Meredith Brown, who are our event planners extraordinaire. And to thank also Professor Jen Beard, Emily Barbo, and Ty Furman, who have been responsible for bringing Sister Jones here and the slate of activities that she has been involved in. And perhaps most importantly, I'm glad that all of you are here to join in with the conversation as we think about where have we come from, where are we right now, and where are we going? So I welcome you here. I am grateful also to two of our co-hosts for this program, the Howard Thurman Center here at the Boston University, and I invite you to get to know the Thurman Center. It is an important resource here at our university, and also the Museum for African American History. And now I want to invite Lemurchi Frazier, who is the coordinator and director of education and interpretation at the museum, to come and to share with us a historical perspective for why this, because this particular conversation is important. Welcome to all of you, and welcome to Lemurchi. Thank you, uh, our gracious hosts. Dr. Harold Cox. Uh, it is indeed my honor to bring to you greetings from the Museum of African American History, its president, Marita Rivero, who could not be here today, um, but she has sent me, and I hope to not disappoint you, uh, the board and staff of the museum in uh, our happiness and delight to share this collaboration of the acknowledgement of the 400 years since 1619 of the Jamestown landing of uh, some of the Africans who uh, landed in this hemisphere. We want to acknowledge this in an observance today and acknowledge ourselves as being here. This thing of being here, present, and accounting for our history is extremely important. We want to uh, especially be uh, honored by the Howard Thurman Center as they have uh, been a real collaborative partner with us. Howard Thurman's wife, Sue Bailey Thurman, began the Museum of African American History in uh, 1966 by finding or in uncovering the building, the African Meeting House, which was built by free black people in Beacon Hill in 1806, organizing themselves as an African society under the leadership of a man whose name is Prince Hall. This acquiring land on Joy Street down to Cambridge Street allowed for this building to be built and to be in this space of a founding city of America in a very special way, serving as an epicenter for the abolition of slavery. And so with that, I bring you greetings from the Museum of African American History and want to talk about a couple of things with you. In her reference to the Western Hemisphere and the arrival of Columbus, Jamaica Kincaid writes in her essay in history, in 1492, I was not in the narrative yet. But that does not mean that we were not here. It is not recorded that we are here. What I wanted to say about that is that this event gives us the important date and anniversary of 1619. And while we recognize that, we also want to recognize the African presence in this hemisphere prior to 1619 with dates like 
1524, 1526, 1565, which points to a continuum of African presence for a 400 plus years here in the Americas. Conventional history tends to confine African Americans to the roles they played during the periods of antebellum slavery, the civil rights movement, but in reality, Africans preceded the English by a century with the establishment of maroon communities in Georgia and Florida 80 years before the landing in Jamestown. And with the establishment of these communities, Africans arrived in the Americas in numbers that far exceeded the Europeans four to one up until 1820. And so black people developed and defended New World settlements, undermined slavery, and championed freedom throughout the hemisphere from the 16th century, the 1500s. So as we consider this context of this live history and presence of people, what was their personhood? How are they being considered in this space? I am here to also say welcome to you and to reimagine in that context welcome as a comfort and a hospitality for this event. But as we look at that, as we explore the word welcome, there are some considerations I want us to consider. As this water delivers the Africans, that water should, that should be free to us all, that terse Atlantic Ocean in their journey from 60 to 90 days here. What is it that we consider about the welcome of that water to this hemisphere as the conveyor of ships that land the African onto land stolen from the indigenous people? We have to grapple with the frankness of this history. This is a moment for our reclamation of the psyche that we can improve and reclaim health for. It is significant that this is being done in the School of Public Health as the stresses that slavery produces have been endemic in some of what has happened to the health in black communities. As we look at this historical perspective, we can say that this welcome to the African may have not been a welcome really at all. Where was the welcome? Was it a hand, warm friendship of welcome that was extended? Or was it what we are really here to talk about today, that blade of systemic white supremacy that was a design to bring the African here under the servitude of slavery, uncompensated for their labors? disengaged from their families and the places and the land that they knew, bringing their skills here. Oh, Dr. Cox asked, where do we go from here? And I think that is extremely important in considering that with the device of slavery, we can say that we want to now reimagine welcoming ourselves with the demographics and the beautiful complexions and hues that are in this room. Taking that into account of where our future is going up from this moment of 400 years of servitude, we want to consider a renewal of our energy. And this conference today, this event, as we take away the thoughts of the presenters, will enable us to be able to do that. We consider that we want to uh, understand the continuum of African presence in the Western Hemisphere and how important it was in establishing America, how important it was in establishing freedom and democracy as a thing, as a real thing. And in the de Declaration of Independence and the Constitution that Martin Luther King says are the important, most, two most important documents that have ever been produced. We want to think about how those Africans were situated in that document as we consider this history. Do we continue the pace as the African, early African descendants 
did to resist slavery, to build community and citizenship, so well demonstrated by the Boston Beacon Hill community led by Prince Hall, uh, how they formed organizations. They had networks that reached to Philadelphia, to New York, to Maine with these African meeting houses and places where people could gather and find some camaraderie with those who wanted to end slavery in this country. We want to consider that despite those circumstances of oppression that slavery put forward to us, that the, their mounting triumphant actions led the way for us to redefine the personhood of the African, to look at the commitment to freedom and democracy. We want to hear in Massachusetts especially look at the marriage of colonialism and slavery. When we think of the legitimacy that was given to slavery by the body of liberties in 1641, which set forth 90 articles that determined the freedom and the protection of the Puritans and pilgrims, yet number 91 says there should be no slavery except one is captured or one sells oneself into slavery. 1641 is that moment, which makes Massachusetts the first colony in America to adopt slavery by contract legally. So it is from that moment that we want to consider this anniversary as a continuum timeline of looking at freedom. We want to look at this trade in humans as a, uh, as a moniker of inequity that we, we come to as we consider the oppression of uh, black people and people of color in this hemisphere. There were stories that we can connect to that I want to bring as we meet the African here, especially in Boston for the historic presence here. We can look at, we know about a man named Crispus Attucks who had an Ashante father and a Wampanoag mother who escaped slavery in 1750 from Framingham and then is back here on the, the date of March 5th, 1770, for what is to become the Boston Massacre, as he gives his life for his own understanding of what it is to rebel and resist. We can consider that as a marker. We can also consider the marker of Prince Hall in 1775, here organizing as a manumitted African having his freedom, having negotiated for his, uh, for his own self one day a week with his enslaver to earn his own money, establishing the leadership of a community through a Masonic order, G moving on from that to the African society and the use of petitions to make known the demands for returning to Africa, for wages and compensation, for education for the children, for a place to worship freely, which results in that African meeting house. We want to consider in this the stories of African descended people like Elizabeth Freeman, whose former enslaved name was Mumbet, who serves in a home in Western Massachusetts and applies on the basis of all born free and equal, a phrase she's hearing as they are adopting and, and writing the Declaration of Independence of Sheffield. We find that Elizabeth Freeman is responsible for the end of slavery in Massachusetts, thank God, in 1783, bringing her case as a woman who cannot bring her case by herself with an African-American man named Boss. It is Elizabeth Freeman on this day, October 18th, in 1883, 29, that's 1783, 1829, she's still alive, who is now creating on that day her last will and testament, where she has now, in that course between slavery and freedom, been able to purchase her own property and leave it to her descendants, one of which is W.E.B. Du Bois. When we think about that as a moniker, of a woman who joins the ranks of Zipporah 
Potter Atkins, who is an African-American woman who owned property in 1670, now marked on the Rose Greenway. We can consider contributions of Africans like Prince Hall and Phyllis Wheatley, who are a part of a committee to, abol to abolish slavery and help the Puritans reckon with their function and complicity in enslaving Africans and the challenge to them. We can reckon with this, this anniversary also as one who brings, and I think particularly important to the School of Public Health, in 1706, a man whose name is Onesimus Math, who is then named Onesimus Mather because his enslaver is Cot Reverend Cotton Mather, who brings with him, as there is a 1721 outbreak of smallpox, he brings the African system of inoculation with him to these shores as an enslaved man, which helps to save many people in Boston during that epidemic, and is then uh, codified as a practice with the illumination of two doctors from London and the Reverend Cotton Mather. It is Onesimus who brings that practice to us. So with that, I want to uh, acknowledge that there were even ads that year in Boston of the arrival for purchase of 250 Negroes in the Boston Gazette who had been kept away from the disease of smallpox. And this was a selling point. So as we think about all this stuff, what are we going to do with it? We want to acknowledge that these were not empty vessels. These were people who were here. We want to acknowledge that in this anniversary, the timeline trajectory of African descended people contributing immediately to every facet of American history as explorers, sailors, lawyers, litigants, soldiers, laborers, settlers, artisans, artists, activists, translators, teachers, doctors, nurses, mathematicians, scientists, entrepreneurs, scholars, engineers, politicians, priests, poets, and now presidents. This is our welcome, a call to action for racial, social, and spatial justice. Welcome to the salute to account, personhood, truth, survival, and renewed commitment to create our own next 400 years of freedom. Hashtag welcome to you together, emphatically stated. Thank you. I'm looking for our next presenter. Yeah, great, great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Lemurchie. Colonel William Brooks is our first keynote speaker for this morning. Mr. Brooks is the professor of practice at Kennedy School at the Harvard University. We don't usually say that word in this building, but <laughs> it's all right. Carnell, I'm glad you're here. Uh, he's the director of the Trotter Center for Public, Re Public Leadership. He is the former president and CEO of NAACP. He's an attorney. He's the fourth generation pastor, which means that he's got ministry in his veins, in his genes. Um, he are, has an incredibly impressive resume that I invite you to read in your bulletin. But the thing that I really want to say about Brother Brooks is that he is smart, he is thoughtful, he is an advocate, he's willing to ask the hard questions, and he is very willing to demand that you get the right answers. And perhaps most importantly, he's here with us today. Please welcome Carnell William Brooks. Good morning. Good morning. Now, left out of that uh, warm introduction is the fact that while I may 
work at Harvard, um, I hail from Boston University School of Theology. So I, we, we want to be clear about that. It is an absolute delight and humbling honor to be at my alma mater on this occasion. So let me first begin with the words my very southern grandmother uh, taught me to begin every speech, every sermon, uh, every important occasion, those words being thank you. I want to thank the dean, uh, these assembled scholars, staff, most importantly students for providing an occasion for me to come and to partake in this important convening. I'm reminded that this day is a morally poignant moment in the history of America and the Americas. I'm reminded that we are not here as a matter of historical coincidence or moral happenstance. I'm reminded that this convening, this occasion, occurs within moments, within days, of the recognition of Indigenous Peoples Day, which is to say we recognize the contributions of Native peoples and Indigenous peoples and the enslavement of Indigenous peoples well before the arrival, of the re first recorded arrival of Africans in the summer of 1619. We're reminded that this day is an incredibly important day, an occasion for us to mark, to celebrate the contributions of Africans on these shores. But this is not a matter of happenstance. It is not a matter of coincidence. We have 400 years of history, 400 years of data and diaries, statistics and stories, art and humanity, soul and spirit. This is a moment in which we are confronted with a multitude of faces who stare us across the expanse of time and history and soul. This is a moment in which our foremothers and our four Fathers, our forebears are literally in this room. They are standing in this room. They're watching this commemoration, this celebration of their history in this place, in this country, in this moral moment. It is a moment in which we are confronted with so much history, we might look for some discerning interpretive principle in order to make sense of why we're here and why we have been called to uh, take up this matter of 400 years of inequality, breaking the cycle of systemic racism. Moral philosophers, as well as legal philosophers, biblical scholars, as well as legal scholars, engage in what is called hermeneutics, a science of interpretation. And so today, I'd just like to lift up as a topic, if you will, a hermeneutic of resistance and a history of resilience. In other words, if we were to interpret this history, the stories that we have been given with a hermeneutic of resistance, that is to say, not only taking note of the fact that we were enslaved in this place for more than two and a half centuries, but also taking note of the fact that there were at least 250 major slave rebellions. In other words, not only taking note of our troubles and our travails and our tears, but also our struggles, our aspirations, our moral amb ambitions, all that we did to free ourselves. And so this is a moment in which we want to use a hermeneutic of resistance. We use this hermeneutic of resistance in this interpretive principle so that we might look at history as not merely a, a, a black and white recording of facts and data attesting to all the troubles and travails our people have been through and come through, but we use this principle of a, a hermeneutical principle of resistance to see the struggles and the efforts of our people to free themselves and to free this very republic. And so, implying this hermeneutic of resistance which bears witness to a history of resilience, we take note of the fact that there is a relationship between slavery 
not as an uh, artifact of, of, of American antiquity, with slavery as part and parcel of our past and part and parcel of our present. We take note of the fact that there's a relationship, an unbroken line between the past, the present, and the future. Yes, Africans arrived on these shores in that fateful summer on that awful ship. But we also take note of the fact that our people were enslaved, but the enslavement of our, our people gave birth to a, a legal structure. The black codes, I should say the slave codes, the black codes, Jim Crow, the felony convict leasing system, the new Jim Crow, this era of mass incarceration, there's a relationship between slavery and criminal law and public health. We take note of the fact that there was a perverse economic incentive during slavery to keep the slaves alive because they were literally units of productivity. But we also note that with the birth and creation of the convict leasing system, there was a perverse incentive to literally work former slaves to death. As one scholar put it, work one to death. When one dies, get another. And so there's relationship between slavery, our legal regime during the era of Jim Crow, and the health and well-being of African Americans in this very day. We take note of the fact that slavery literally shaped our dietary habits shape what we deem to be healthy and life-sustaining. We take note of the fact that slavery and Jim Crow literally had their fingerprints on our genetic well-being, our health. In other words, those of you in this room who are in your 50s or 60s, who have lived in the shadow of Jim Crow, Jim Crow segregation, de jure segregation, de facto segregation may be seen in your health and well-being today. To the extent that segregation and Jim Crow, de jure, and de facto influence and affected your upbringing, that may be felt, seen, experienced in your health and well-being this very day. Lest you think that this is merely uh, an academic uh, matter for me. I can recall, I should say, I can recall my mother telling me, my grandmother telling me as I was growing up in the low country of South Carolina. She said to me, my, that is to say my grandmother, she said to me, she said, son, when you came into this world, you did not make a great first impression. <laughs> she described for me uh, my birth in El Paso, Texas, where my father served at Fort Bliss. I was born in General William Beaumont Hospital in El Paso, Texas, when my father served in the U.S. Army after Truman's order to desegregate the military, well after that in 1948. Because I was born in a military hospital at three pounds and three ounces, when the doctors came to my mother's side, my mother was only 19 years of age, and told her, your son is not likely to live beyond the end of the day. So she said, or rather they said, if you're religious, you should have someone come and bless your child. So they looked for a, uh, a priest, I couldn't find one. Looked for a minister, a Protestant minister, couldn't find one. They did, in fact, find a rabbi who uh, properly baptized me. My grandmother told me that story because she wanted to remind me of my good fortune, which is to say to be born in a military hospital that was desegregated, that had a premium unit that could ensure my life and well-being. Had I been born in the low country of South Carolina, in the segregated town that my mother was raised in, in the segregated hospital that declined to treat her, perhaps born in a community where there was a segregated pharmacy that did not provide drugs and pharmaceuticals to our people on an equal basis. If I were born in the town 
where as a little boy, I still recall when it came time for me to get a pair of shoes, my grandmother played a little game, which is to say I would stand on a piece of construction paper and we would play a game whereby I would draw with crayons uh, a little footprint. And then my grandmother would magically take the cutout of my little feet off to the store and bring back a pair of shoes. Now that was a testament to her creativity, but also a testament to the ugliness of Jim Crow segregation. My grandmother reminded me that had I been born in that segregated little town that she was raised in, and my grandmother was raised in, and my grandfather was raised in, I might not be here. That segregation then is present now. That segregation then affects children, it affected children then, it affects children now. But I want to suggest to you that, that this, this matter of segregation is not a matter of the distant past. Uh, it affects the health and well-being of children this very day. But not only children, adults. When we consider the fact that we have 2.2 million Americans behind bars, 70 million Americans with criminal records, 1 million fathers behind bars. When we think about the fact that the Department of Corrections has jurisdiction over more black men today than were enslaved during slavery. When we think about that the largest or certainly one of the largest providers of health care to the African American community is not Blue Cross and Blue Shield or Kaiser Permanente, but the Department of Corrections in states all across this country, it is a damn shame. But we have to be clear that this, 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 this matter of, of racism coming to bear on people's lives in terms of their health and public health in this country manifests itself in, in morally perverse ways in unexpected places. So for example, in our criminal justice system, when judges, prosecutors, determine that black children are older, more responsible, more morally culpable, they subject them to harsher punishment. But if our prosecutors and our judges and our jailers were sui generis, a thing unto themselves, unique unto themselves, it would be one thing. But when our doctors and our nurses and our health care providers, according to the studies, believe that black people can endure more pain that they should receive less pain medication, and where we have separate legal regimes for the provision of drugs, which is to say we deem some drugs to be legal and okay to uh, uh, regulate pain. Uh, we call those opioids, and if you use them in excess, we call that an addiction. But if you self-medicate in poor neighborhoods, we call that those drugs uh, not opioids, we call them dope, we call them weed, we call it heroin, we call it crack. It's the kind of thing you can be locked up with the key having been thrown away for life. Se separate, not necessarily equal, and thoroughly segregated provision of health care, reflecting what we see in the school system, in the criminal justice system, and certainly in housing. When this many years after the Brown versus Board of Education decision, where we see in New York City more segregation than we see in Jackson, Mississippi. When we see in New Jersey hypersegregation that we don't see in Alabama. We know that we have work to do, and it's not merely segregation in terms of our schools, not merely segregation in terms of our housing, but segregation in the provision of health care and the regard with which black and brown people are held by health care professionals. But as I said, to su set, suggested and said at the outset, I believe in a hermeneutic of resistance bearing witness to a history of resilience. And if we were to lift up three paradigmatic uh, role models of social justice, bearing in mind that we are at Boston University, which has a tradition, a moral lineage, and legacy of social justice, I believe we can walk away from this convening with some hope, bearing in mind that hope is not empirically demonstrated but morally chosen. 
three paradigmatic individuals. So if we were to think about the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, who reminds us that in order to bring about change, we need moral architects. And moral architects are not relegated to the domain of moral philosophy. Moral architects are engaged with the reform of public health, the reform of health care, the reform of our nation's criminal justice laws, the reform of housing. Moral architects do not allow themselves to be balkanized, don't allow themselves to be segregated. We need moral architects everywhere and throughout our society. So when we think about the fact that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King came to Boston University School of Theology to study personalistic moral philosophy. He came here because there was a tradition of social justice. You'll, rem you'll remember that during the time that Dr. King studied at Boston University, it was during the era of Jim Crow. Why did he come to Boston University? Because there was a dean by the name of Walter Mueller, Mueller who decided that there were an insufficient number of African Americans with PhDs in the pulpit. And so as a consequence, a tiny school in the midst of a large university, that is to say Boston University School of Theology, at one point educated more than 50% of all black PhDs in social ethics and systematic theology and religion in the entire country. Don't tell me what we can't do. And so Dr. King comes to Boston University and he studies systematic theology with Walter Mulder, with Harold DeWolf, with all these legendary philosophers here on this staff or here at Boston University. And then he goes to Montgomery, Alabama and starts a civil rights revolution. He was not an expert in public accommodations law when he challenged the segregation laws on the buses in Montgomery. He was not an expert in fair housing law because it didn't exist at the time. He was not an expert in the intricacies of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act because the Voting Rights Act had not been written. He was an expert in moral aspiration. So in order for us to reform public health, in this country and the provision of health care in this country and housing in this country and criminal justice in, the in this country, we need moral architects who are not hyper-specialized specialists, but who are proudly generalists when it comes to social justice. <laughs> so I just confess that it gives me a certain amount of pride that three years ago, the dean invited me to come and speak at a conference entitled Ferguson in Public Health. This was not at the law school, not at the school of government, but at the school of public health. And can I tell you, Dean, I just got to say this as a footnote. <laughs> at the NAACP, I had a rule. With, when it comes to invitations to speak, if it has to do with raising money for social justice, we say yes. If it has to do with activism, for social justice, we say yes. To everything else, we say no. But when I got an invitation to come to my alma mater to talk about social justice in the context of public health, I had to come, and so much so I had to come back again. <laughs> Three paradigmatic individuals, Martin Luther King. The second paradigmatic individual that I like to lift up is Pauli Murray. Pauli Murray, for those of you who, who yet to become enthralled by the, the arc of her life, Pauli Murray, I grew up in North Carolina and in Baltimore. Pauli Murray was an activist before law school. She gave a speech somewhere and Thurgood Marshall heard her and decided that he had to have her in his class at Howard University Law School. He may not and may have neglected to tell her that she would be the only woman in her class. Pauli Murray graduated in a class of sexes and we can safely say during that time it was a class of sexes because that's what men were then and largely what we are now. But she graduated number one in her class. And she wrote a term paper. I want the students in the room to hear this. She wrote a term paper her third year in law school in which she argued that 
de jure segregation could be defeated within 25 years. And she argued that Jim Crow segregation could be defeated if we focus on the separate part of separate but equal. They put her term paper aside. Years later, the men, Thurgood, Spotswood, Robinson, Jack Greenberg, they unearthed her paper. Students, take note of this. They, unnote, they unearthed her paper, which she turned into a book, which was called the Bible of Segregation Laws. And the men used this law student's paper turned into a book to defeat Jim Crow. She then became a, an associate in a New York law firm, met a young, seemingly shy firebrand who later came to be known as RBG, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And this woman, Pauli Murray, inspired her to challenge the application of the Equal Protection Clause in terms of women. I want to lift up here in this convening and this conference the fact that Pauli Murray graduated top of her class at Howard University Law School. She was an activist. She came to be an Episcopal priest, a founder of the National Organization of Women, a posthumous author on the brief which argued successfully, successfully for the application of the Equal Protection Clause to women. Uh, she became a poet. Here's the moral of the study, of the story. Injustice is intersectional. Therefore, our opposition to injustice must also be intersectional. And in the School of Public Health, if we adopt intersectional means as a way of re arriving at a just end, we must also adopt an interdisciplinary means of reaching that just end. So in other words, we need in the School of Public Health some folk who spend time at the School of Theology, who spend time at the School of Law, who spend time in the School of Government. We need everybody focused on public health because public health by its definition is interdisciplinary and intersectional social science and science. In other words, Dean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe in the School of Public Health, there's an intersection of science and social science. And I also believe in the School of Public Health at the intersection of science and social science is the intersection of justice and injustice. And standing at that intersection are scholars and students and staff and people who are dedicated to realizing justice in the context of what we do and study here. Third, I'm going to argue here that those of us who engage in the, the study of science or social science uh, are really in the army of social justice. Now, I know some of you all may, may, may take exception to that. that. That's not your job description. Uh, that's not on your curriculum vitae. I, I understand that, but I want to make a modest little case here. So if we think about two social scientists, Kenneth B. and Mamie Clark, who, Mamie Clark, uh, a psychologist, began to study the effect of segregation on children's psyche and their psychological makeup and their self-esteem and their well-being. I want to argue here that Mamie and Kenneth B. Clark, looking at the psychological impact on African-American children in the segregated Jim Crow de jure public school system, I want to argue that she was applying a public health model to a public education problem. In other words, looking at the mass effect of segregation on children. I'm going to argue this. Now, the Clarks produce a study uh, the, the famous doll study in which children had, were given a choice, black children were given a choice between a black doll and a white doll uh, that were identical. And we found that black children then would choose the white doll, attributing to the white doll intelligence and beauty and desirability. And to the black doll, they would attribute ugliness and a lack of intelligence and a lack of desirability 
or being wanted. The Clarks produce a study which Thurgood Marshall, having taken Pauli Murray's scholarship, then takes their study. And he puts the study and Pauli Marshall's scholarship in the brief that went before the court and Brown v. Board of Education. Now, I want you to hear this. On one side, you had precedent and years of custom in terms of treating people uh, separately and unequal. On the other side, you had social science, a creative legal argument, but also moral ambition. The point being here is we can instrumentalize science and social science in service of social justice. And so in other words, the articles that you're creating and crafting for peer-reviewed journals might also make their way into Teen Vogue. They might also make their way into Instagram. They might also make their way onto Twitter. They might also make their way into conversation at the barber shop and at the beauty shop and make their way into that place called the intersection of justice and injustice. The work that we do is critically important. The papers that we write are critically important. The scholarship that we craft and create on a daily basis not only instructs, it can inspire. Because the scholarship of the Clarks not only make the empirical case that separate was inherently unequal, it also made the moral case that we're all equal. Scholarship is critically important. And so I want to say to you as we come into this convening today, we must do so with a sense of our own analytic and moral self-importance. We come to this place knowing that our work matters, knowing that our scholarship matters, knowing that our lectures matter, knowing that when we inspire a generation of students to take up this mighty work, it matters, knowing that we can affect and bend the arc of history and that it matters, knowing that at Boston University, in the place where Howard Thurman stood, where the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King stood, where Elie Wiesel stood. This is a place where people matter and the work that we do matters. It matters. But in case you're not convinced <laughs> by virtue of the, the modest historical case I tried to make, the three paradigmatic individuals I tried to lift up, the uh, interpretive principle of hermeneutics I tried to apply in terms of resistance, bearing witness to a history of resilience. May I just come to a close and leave you with a bit of poetry? The words being these. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our joy Rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as a rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dog passed has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun. Let us march on. Let us march on. Let us march on. Let us march on till victory is won. revamping our program just a moment and and Mr. Brooks is it's graciously um, asked if there are any questions that your comments that you have yeah we have a couple we have a room for a couple of them hi thank you my name is Bindu Kalesan and uh, my question to you is that you know we uh, in academia we do quite a lot of work showing, okay, there's disparity there, there's disparity here, but I've also found that what we do is just present that in papers, and 
sort of take credit for that and we sit back. But I feel that there is not a lot of advocacy and, and um, practice. So there are elements of biases around ourselves. Like being a person of color in this university is not easy for me. Mm. Like people would not step into the elevator with me. Mm. And that happens. And then there are implicit bias education programs around here where they are blatantly saying that explicit bias is over and done, and there is only the matter of implicit bias. So unless and until we actually address the real thing, I feel that, okay, that's not enough, right? Our, uh, and I understand what, when you say it matters, but how should it really matter? So to be clear that uh, to say our work matters, it means that we use it. And we use it uh, internally in terms of challenging systems of exclusion. We can use it externally um, through litigation to challenge systems of exclusion. And so in other words, to produce a paper uh, addressing implicit bias does not suggest implicit as in less than a standard of accountability. Right? So in other words, we see in, in the academy, not unlike what we see in law firms, not unlike what we see in, in plants or investment banks and many other places in this, in this society, both implicit and explicit bias. And so what I've found in, in the course of 25 years as a civil rights lawyer, uh, you have to make the empirical case, make the moral case, but you have to use what it is that you have, which is to say you do have to file complaints. You do have to challenge systems. You do have to suggest new, different, more inclusive standards. In other words, uh, it, it, it is not merely enough to prove that there's a problem. We also have to take the responsibility of at least partnering with those who are willing to put forward policy prescriptions as to how to solve the problem. Last point here. When I say it matters, scholars who are willing to partner with those to get their work out. So in other words, I, I can recall, let me co concrete example. In New Jersey, uh, there was a scholar by the name of Diva Padgett. She wrote a book uh, called Marked, focusing on the record, I should say, on the, uh, on the well-being of people behind bars and the effect of having a criminal record. Uh, we used her scholarship and the scholarship of others to ensure that people leaving prison uh, received um, two months supply worth of prescription drugs, drugs. They were reconnected with Medicaid, that they received their medical records. And so in other words, when you take the scholarship and put it on other platforms, and so I, what I'm gonna argue here is scholars uh, can be like Martin Luther King or Bayard Rustin. Bayard Rustin was probably a better student of nonviolence. Dr. King was a better popularizer of nonviolence. We need those who bring fresh insights uh, and craft and create and ideate, but we also need those who disseminate and, and, and synthesize and popularize knowledge. We need both. And the fact that here at the School of Public Health, they have students and scholars and practitioners in the same space, that helps us get a little, a little closer to where we need to be. I hope that, I hope that answers your question. Let's take one more. Mine is a quick comment, and I, over here. I just wanted to thank you for uh, discussing intersectionality through an interdisciplinary lens. And as a graduate of the BU School of Social Work, I want to give a shout out to our, my colleagues in social work because I believe that we often get forgotten in the list of professions and that we need to be there because we are the, I would argue as a past president of NASW, the glue that keeps this country together um, and are doing the work that people don't see. And as a black gay uh, professional, professor, assistant dean at Simmons University, I also want to laud your lifting up Pauli Murray and mis mentioning Bayard Rustin. They mean many things to many people, but right. to us in the black queer community, they are sheroes and heroes. That's right. Thank you. Uh, hello, thank you. Uh, echoing again what was said by one of my colleagues here about Polly Murray, and thank you again for highlighting and focusing on uh, how she, they talked about set the separate part of separate but equal. And um, very often in 2019, what we're hearing now, one of the famous quotes or something that we're hearing now is um, unity and difference. So I'm wondering what does it look like to focus on the unity part of unity and difference in um, today? Well, focusing on the, on the unity part does not mean obliterating or obscuring the difference. 
It, it, it just means assuming a shared uh, and common and uplifting uh, humanity, right? So in other words, when we think about Pauli Murray, who years before we had the, the moral and legal vocabulary for transgender and transgender rights, she was expressing theologically her humanity. She was expressing to the extent that she could through the law her humanity and lifting up the humanity of others. So when I look at intersectional movements now uh, that are interdisciplinary, that are intergenerational, younger people, older people, scholars, students, people in the streets, one of the things I think is critically important is, at, going back to the work of Dr. King, lifting up the imago Dei, the innate, inherent worth of everybody, and that means not just a moral term down at the School of Theology, but in the academy that people have something to offer analytically. To go to my brother over here who's a social worker, I can't name one effective social, uh, civil rights lawyer who's not listening to practitioners, social workers, who will bring a problem forward uh, that looks like this. They'll say, that's wrong, therefore it should be illegal. Lawyers are used to saying it's illegal, therefore it's wrong, okay? <laughs> we need that intersectionality uh, to do the work and we need to, Focus on our shared humanity. Last point here is where we have some folks who are taking a remedial course, a catch-up course uh, in the vocabulary. Uh, they're not quite sure what transgender rights. They don't. They, they get their vocab. They get their pronouns mixed up. I think it's important to, to focus on our shared humanity and raise people up and support people. So in other words, we don't, we don't put people down because they don't get the words right, they, they don't have the moral vocabulary, they're not woke yet, right? So, we, you know, because uh, I got kids, but I also got a 75-plus-year-old mother, we want to have everybody involved in the struggle.